Well, uh, just before uh, we came to church, um, I think uh, Asher received a text from Astro as to what is the, um, the title for the sermon. So I said I'll be uh, preaching on John the Baptist, and then um, I think he gave up trying to prepare all the songs for John the Baptist. <laughs> I forgot to tell him that, um, yeah, I, I know what uh, some of the favorite hymns of John the Baptist. He was at me, <laughs> but uh, I know it's tough, all right? And um, so this evening we'll be doing a character study on John the Baptist. And uh, please uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 11 and verse 7. In Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 7. And let's stand as we read from verse 7 to verse 11. I'll be reading verse 7 to verse 11. Let's stand as we uh, read this uh, passage of Scripture. In Matthew 11 and verse 7, the Scripture reads, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft clothing are in a king's houses. Uh, but what went ye out for to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger. Before thy face we shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them there are born of women that had not be, uh, reason a greater than John the Baptist, Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he that is spring. Our precious Lord, as we gather here, even this evening, in thy house and in thy presence, once again, Lord, we say given the precious blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us of our sins. And as we gather in this manner to worship you in the spirit and in truth, we humbly even seek your blessing and the riches of your blessing and your power be upon your word, that our hearts will be strengthened, comforted, and encouraged as your word continue to meet our needs and the right our path. We commit this hour preaching unto your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, in this, uh, passage of, uh, in this passage of Scripture, we see um, a brief description about John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist uh, is not some um, you know, guy who is soft and um, lives in, king, in the king's palace. And uh, he uh, lives out in the wilderness. And of course, we know he had a wild honey and a locust. And um, uh, he basically uh, lived kind of uh, out there in the wilderness. And uh, to be uh, commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ is something. And the Lord Jesus said in uh, verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them there are born of women that had not risen the greater than John the Baptist. And so in the eyes of our Savior, John the Baptist is the greatest uh, man that is born of uh, women. And... Um, so this morning, uh, rather this evening, we want to study on one of the, the greatest men uh, in the world. I'm sure we like to uh, look at some examples, uh, even in the world, and uh, we like to emulate them. For example, uh, some folks, uh, they want to know maybe about getting rich, you know, about investment. And sometimes we like to read the book, uh, uh, rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, by Robert um, Kiyosaki, and uh, he seems to be very successful. I mean, he owns properties of the properties, and uh, so some folks have said, uh, well, we want to emulate him, you know, we buy his book and we study his principles. Um, some will look at, um, you know, some, uh, the, the, the biggest church in America, uh, Joe Austin, uh, Lakewood uh, Church, and they say, wow, you know, this is the biggest church in the world. And uh, we would like to study it and uh, to see what we can learn out of it. By the way, we don't subscribe to his, his practice or beliefs. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, there are people like that. And uh, we look for some of the, the greatest uh, person uh, in, in, their, in, their, in their fumes. And um, even like um, we look to Spurgeon and Moody, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, I heard one preacher um, he said this uh, when he was young, uh, he tried 
to imitate all these great preachers. You know, he got their sermon. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, you know, sinners in the uh, hand of a mighty uh, holy God. He said, I preached all these sermons, but I wasn't successful. <laughs> and I was trying to imitate, uh, but I got nowhere. Um, we like to uh, look at all these characters and we try to follow them and uh, kind of follow their footsteps and emulate them. But the Bible uh, gave us a person, uh, the greatest man in the world, John the Baptist. In the Old Testament, there are lots of prophets. You have Elijah, Elisha, you know what I mean? You have Samuel and so on. And uh, yet, uh, among all these all this, uh, people, there is none greater than John the Baptist. And so if he's the greatest man in the world, I'm sure, uh, God uh, penned down the scriptures for us to um, follow his example or to understand why he ended up as the greatest man in, in the world. Um, if we take our Bibles and we go to the uh, Gospel of Luke in chapter 1 and verse 5, in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 5, we want to see the uh, beginning of John the uh, Baptist in chapter 1 and in uh, verse 5. Uh, it reads, uh, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the cause of uh, Abiam and his wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the chief, uh, the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the uh, custom of the priest's office. His lot was to burn incense, and when he went to the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing in the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, uh, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak until the day that this thing shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Well, uh, this... Um, Passage of Scripture described uh, the uh, birth of John the Baptist. And there was a priest, Zechariah, and then he had a, uh, a wife by name Elizabeth. And they were a godly uh, couple. Um, but uh, the Bible says uh, they were childless. You know, so often we measure success you know, by um, our walk with the Lord. And sometimes we tend to compare things or we compare you know, uh, even having children and so on. Um, but uh, this couple, they were, uh, they were precious in the, in the eyes of God, um, despite the fact that uh, they were childless. And so there came upon a time Zacharias went to a temple to offer the incense. Um, I read somewhere that probably they only do this once in their lifetime uh, because of so many priests and they go by their course and their lawn. And so it was his turn to do that. And while doing that, uh, Gabriel appeared to him. And he says, Zacharias, you're going to have a child. And of course, uh, Zacharias said um, in the verse 18, uh, Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And then in verse 20, Gabriel said, um, Wow, well, you're going to be dumb, all right? <laughs> because you didn't believe my word. Uh, I think this is so uh, characteristic of us all. Uh, we pray to God. And then when God answers us, we say, now, how can that be true? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I can imagine a comical uh, uh, discourse between Gabriel and uh, Zacharias. And Gabriel will be asking Zacharias, man, all these years, what were you praying for? Say, I'm praying for a child. 
And what was your condition? You know, I'm old and stricken. I don't think I can. Then why are you praying for a child? You know what I mean? And say, yeah, but, you know, we believe that God can do the impossible. Okay, now here I'm giving a child. Oh, hey, I don't believe it, and I'm going to have a child. And uh, this is how it works in prayer, most of us. And um, we are just human. Every time God answers our prayers, we get surprised. I think we shouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? We should be thankful and grateful. You know, but we shouldn't be surprised because the Bible says, ask and it shall be given. If it's in the will of God, we keep asking, you know, God will give it to us eventually. And so this was uh, with regard to the birth of uh, John the Baptist. As we take our Bible and go to Luke chapter 1 and in verse 80, uh, in verse 80, it talks about, uh, the Bible reads, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts uh, till the day of his showing unto Israel. Um, some folks uh, sometime in reading this passage, and we think that John the Baptist grew up in the wilderness and the desert. You know, and he must be some hillbillies, I can't think. <laughs> Um, but if you know the uh, culture of the Israelite, if John the Baptist's father you know, uh, is a priest, John the Baptist will be studying in the priesthood. And it's, he'll be well educated uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Jewish law you know, for the first 20 years of his life. And then thereafter, he probably went to the wilderness. So John the Baptist is not an uneducated man. Uh, he's a highly educated man acquainted with the, uh, the, the Word of God and the laws of God. And uh, he was uh, out in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now I believe that all of us, we have our wilderness experience. There will be a time that God will uh, take us aside and then he deals with us privately. Um, and you look at the Apostle Paul, he spent like uh, two and a half years or three and a half years in Arabia before his... Uh, his public ministry. Uh, we look at the uh, Israelites. They had their wilderness journey before they head to the promised land. And so I think uh, this time in the desert until he appeared at the age of 30 uh, was a great time where God was his uh, teacher. You know, I think he had many moments he walked with the Lord. There are things he didn't understand. You know, he talks to the Lord and the Lord um, showed him things, taught him things from the scripture. And so God was preparing John the Baptist in the wilderness until the age of 30. And uh, we all have our wilderness um, experience. Now, next we want to see uh, John the Baptist, uh, his uh, ministry. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 15. In John chapter 1 and in verse 15, the scripture reads, John chapter 1 and verse 15, John bear witness of him and Christ, saying, this was he whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, in chapter 1 and verse 16, and of his fullness have, have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man had seen God any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He had declared him, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ or the Christos. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, No. And then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? And what sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet uh, Elias. And I draw your attention to, to verse 23. You know, John the Baptist, the greatest man in the world, when they asked him, who art thou? Uh, are you that prophet that Moses talked about? You know, are you the Christos, the Christ? You know, are you Elijah? And he said, I'm uh, none of the above. Then who are you, John? You know, because by then he had a great ministry and, and the uh, cities were empty to come out to hear John the Baptist. And uh, he, the way he described himself, I think should be the way we describe ourselves. John the Baptist say, I'm a voice. You know, of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet uh, Elias. Uh, John the Baptist saw himself as a voice. And we know a voice points to the speaker. You know, I mean, the speaker is God. 
and he was just God's mouthpiece. And that's how John saw himself. You know, and that's how you and I should see ourselves. We are God's mouthpiece. Nothing great about us. You know, I mean, we are here to be a channel of God's blessing. If somebody uh, is lonely, we reach out to him. If somebody is lost, we give them the gospel. You know, somebody needs a word of encouragement, we give them a word of encouragement, but we are just a voice. Uh, but our problem is that we tend to think we are more than a voice. We are somebody, <laughs> you know, but we are, we are nobody, and uh, we are just a voice. And if you want to know why John the Baptist is the greatest man in the world, because John the Baptist, he saw himself nothing more than a voice. You know, that, that is God's mouthpiece. Uh, they bring the gospel to the people of his time. In the gospel, Luke in chapter 3 and verse 3 to verse 5, uh, we'll be just moving the four gospel. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3 to verse 5. In Luke chapter 3 and in verse 3 to verse 5, it says, And all came into the country about Jordan, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, uh, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, John the Baptist, his ministry is a voice. And he's called to prepare the way of the Lord to make the path straight. Uh, every valley will be filled, every mountain will be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. Uh, it is said, uh, again, tradition tell, tells us that there is a queen in those days. And uh, whenever she wants to travel from point A to point B, you know, I mean, the, um, uh, her people will go out. If there's a valley, they will, they will fill it. If there's a hill, they will level it, you know, just to make it straight so that there's no inconveniences uh, to that queen. Uh, I'm not sure how true it is, all right? There's lots of mountains and lots of valley. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's just a, a tradition. Uh, but that was John the Baptist's ministry. There are lots of um, sin in Israel, um, and John the Baptist, his ministry is to turn the heart of the fathers to the son and the heart of the sons to the father. And his job is to prepare the way. And so John the Baptist, when he came preaching, um, I think uh, probably... We would think of him like a Billy Sunday or D.L. Moody. And wherever he preached, he gave invitation. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people would respond, you know, and get saved. And that was his ministry. Um, in Luke chapter 3 and in verse uh, 7 to verse 9, uh, Then said he to the multitude that came uh, forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourself, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So John the Baptist, uh, his message is the message of repentance. Um, you know, John the Baptist, he's not a storyteller. You know, John the Baptist, um, I don't know how many jokes he told over the pulpit. Probably not many. You know, but John the Baptist's ministry is a ministry of repentance. A very simple message. You know, we are sinners. We need to get right with God. You know, we need to make short account of our sin. And uh, we need to repent. And of course, we know from the other portion of the gospel when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said, he called them old generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You see, John the Baptist is so acquainted with many of these Pharisees. We're not saying that none of the Pharisees were saved. Many were eventually saved. Uh, but one thing about the Pharisees is their self-righteousness. And uh, John the Baptist called them generation of vipers. Boy, I think it, takes a lot of courage to call the preacher of those days generation of vipers, literally calling them generation of baby snakes or snakes. Um, 
I mean, it takes a lot of courage. <coughs> and then in verse 8, they bring uh, therefore fruit the worthy of repentance, and, don't, and not say it within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. Um, because I said to you that uh, God is able to, uh, of this stone to raise up children unto Abraham. In verse 9, he says, And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the trees, every tree therefore that which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. One thing about John the Baptist is preaching, he doesn't um, debate, you know, kind of uh, do debates. He doesn't argue, and uh, he just points what is called to the divine axe. And the axe is about to come down on the tree, and the tree that uh, doesn't bear fruit, you know, it's going to be hewn down or chopped down, and uh, will be kind of uh, burned in the fire. You see, one thing about John the Baptist, his preaching is full of power, and uh, you could sense the, uh, the God is in it, and uh, he doesn't point to himself, he's a voice, and he points to that divine axe. I'm told that uh, there is a, uh, a gentleman, a Christian, and uh, one time a non-Christian uh, kind of accosted him, and uh, he's trying to share the gospel. And then he'll come out with this objection. And this Christian, all he did was to quote a Bible verse. You know, hey, I'm good and perfect. Well, in the Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come shall the glory of God. You know, there's no such thing as God of judgment. Well, he quoted Hebrew. Uh, it is the point that the man wants to die after this judgment. He went on and on and on. He didn't argue with him. And every time he came out with an objection, um, you know, this Christian would just simply quote a scripture. And then he ended there and then they parted ways. Um, sometime later, he discovered uh, this non-Christian became a Christian, you know, later on when they met. And when they met, uh, this uh, once a non-believer who became a Christian said unto him, you're not being very fair. Every time I come up with an argument, you take the sword of God and you keep stabbing me. <laughs> you know? And uh, he said, when I go back home, I kind of couldn't sleep. You know, my conscience, you know what I mean? I keep pricking me. And they say, all the time you didn't argue with me, but he just used the word of God and he just keeps stabbing me with the sword of the Lord. And he said, finally he became a Christian. Um, so uh, John the Baptist didn't want to argue. I mean, if you were to read the, the stuff out there by the uh, Darwinists and evolutionists, they say that uh, God can't be the designer of this body because there are vestiges, uh, organs like our appendix, we donate it. You know, our eyes are wired the wrong way, you know what I mean? And uh, the octopus eye is wired the right way and our wiring is upside down. You know, and go on and on, bad design to back God, you know, God to carry out genocide on the um, Canaanites and Malachites, you know, during Noah's flood, you know, God literally drowned every baby that, that were dead then. Um, John the Baptist did not want to go down the rabbit hole and uh, argue with them, and he just gave them the word and he pointed to the divine axe, and he said that axe will come down, and the tree that doesn't bear fruit is going to be hewn down. Uh, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 10 to verse 14. In verse 10, it reads, And the people asked him, saying, God, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, He that had two coats, let him impart to him that none. And he that had meat, let him do likewise. Then came also the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? He said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he was Christ or not. Um, boy, I mean, uh, as, you know, in the ministry, as pastors, we read sermons by Spurgeon, we read sermons by D.L. Moody, you know, we read uh, many of these sermons and we wanted to know, like, uh, what makes uh, this, uh, you know, evangelists or these preachers uh, great? And when we want to listen to the sermon of the greatest man in the world, you know, we were kind of expecting, wow, must some kind of esoteric, deep teachings. You know, but John the Baptist's teaching uh, was so uh, simple. If you got two coat and somebody does, didn't have one, well, it's your job to give it to him. One. You know, I mean, um, the publicans uh, said, what shall we do? 
And uh, in verse 13, it says, Exact no more than that which is appointed unto you. Uh, if we are familiar with the tax farming in those days, the Romans were in power. And then the Jews would say, you know, in this suburb, you know, I would, uh, I would take care of this suburb, the taxation. And they would pay a lump sum to the Roman government. And then they go to the inhabitants and they exact more than is required. And that's why they hated the publicans. In fact, the word publican is almost synonymous with sinner and uh, the tax collectors. And uh, John the Baptist didn't have some esoteric teachings. He merely said, uh, don't, don't ex exact more than what is appointed. And the soldiers, you know, he said, do, do, do no violence to, to the people. And don't accuse any falsely, because there's a, uh, something uh, well known among these soldiers that could accuse anyone and just uh, abuse them. Be content with your wages. And all these are just practical Christian living, nothing spectacular. And that was John the Baptist's uh, teachings and ministry. Um, but the one thing about John the Baptist is the power behind his preaching. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 to verse 6. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 to verse 6. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and the... Uh, leathern, a girdle, about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And there went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. I draw your attention to verse 5. Uh, then went out of him, of him uh, to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan. Now, this shows the uh, power of God upon John the Baptist's ministry. Uh, John the Baptist did not kind of go to them. They came to him. You know, when John the Baptist was preaching, I mean, literally, the cities were empty. You know, by the thousands, they were gathered around River Jordan uh, to listen to John the Baptist preaching and be baptized by him. I mean, um, today we um, go door-to-door -door knocking, but in John the Baptist's day, they uh, went, went to him. You know, he didn't go to them. And that was the power, I mean, that was the, the manifestation of God's power upon him. Um, well, before I came, I, I was just listening to another of uh, David Gibbs' uh, sermon. And um, this time he talks about uh, an incident where pro probably he was a young lawyer. And then he kept uh, trying to reach out to his boss, you know, to invite him to church, invite him to meetings. And then the, vo the boss told him this, if you ask me one more time, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> you know, and, and David uh, Gibbs said, uh, okay, okay, just one time to, for the men's, you know, businessmen's meeting where they're going to preach uh, the gospel. And the boss said, I only go one time after that, don't bother me. All right? So he went to the meeting, Several hundred um, businessmen were at the meeting. And then the preacher that came out to preach, uh, can you imagine when the preacher came out to preach, he say, I don't know why I'm asked to preach. You know, I'm, I'm not used to preaching. And then he got a stack of uh, notes, you know, and uh, halfway through the introduction, he dropped his notes and it's all over the place. And he picked up point number seven and he started with point number seven on his sermon. <laughs> You know, and as he preached, and uh, David Gibbs sat there and said, Man, I invite my boss to, for this preaching, and this guy just don't know how to preach. You know, and, and to cut the story short, uh, after the end of the preaching, uh, this man, he gave an invitation. You know, he said, like, uh, if, you are, if you are not saved, you know, you, you'll be in hell, and uh, those who want to accept Jesus Christ, raise up your hand. And something like 300 hands raised up. You know, and he said, uh, Maybe you didn't understand me. Put down your hands, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, he repeated the same question. You know, and the same 300 hands went up. And uh, David Gibbs, uh, boss next to him, raised up his hand. And he looked at David Gibbs and say, Is this the reason why you invited me here? You know what I mean? To be safe. And uh, David Gibbs said, Yes, that's why I invited him. Now, that kind of preaching is really the power of God. <laughs> 
You know what I mean? And uh, John the Baptist, I mean, he preached in the wilderness. I can imagine his preaching was simple. If you got two coats, give one away to somebody in need. And then by was filled with such power, the city just emptied itself themselves to come to hear John the Baptist uh, preaching. And then in Luke chapter um, 3 and uh, verse uh, 11 onwards, it says, um, I indeed baptize every water unto repentance, but he that come after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly uh, purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the uh, chaffer with unquenchable fire. And then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of thee, and comest down to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Uh, so John the Baptist, was one of his ministries was to identify the Christos or the Christ or the Messiah. And so when Christ came, uh, John the Baptist, um, he, um, through some divine revelation, recognized that this is the Christ and that he uh, baptized the Lord. Now, actually, this uh, meeting is quite interesting. Uh, while we are familiar with the scripture, John and uh, Jesus, they were actually half cousins. You know, and uh, I thought they would known, have known each other. <laughs> Um, but uh, John said, I don't know who is he, you know, but when he appears, uh, I know who he is, who is he, uh, who is he? and uh, he will baptize Christ. Um, so it is said the Lord Jesus Christ walked about 70 miles from Galilee to River Jordan to be baptized. And uh, if Christ had to walk 70 miles to be baptized, I mean that uh, we need to be baptized if we are not. You know, baptism is important. And when Christ was baptized, when he went up straight away, the voice from heaven in verse 17 said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Um, now, next we want to see uh, John's humility. <coughs> in the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 23. In John chapter 3 and verse 23, He reasoned, and John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Well, if somebody wants to know why baptism is not by sprinkling, but by immersion, well, verse 23 says baptism requires much water. So the time of the year, River Jordan becomes very low. You can't immerse. And John the Baptist has to change to another location to carry out immersion. Verse 24, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest a witness, behold the same baptizer, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourself bear me witness that I say I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He, had, he that had the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth, and heareth him rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now in this uh, shorter passage of scripture, we see the uh, humility of uh, John the Baptist. Um, boy, they say the... Um, there are two kinds of disaster. One is something terrible or bad happened to you. But the other kind of disaster is something terribly good happened to your neighbor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Man, my neighbor just uh, make a million dollars. Oh, man, I mean, uh, we, we feel bad about it. <laughs> Why not me? Why my neighbor? <laughs> but when somebody, when John's disciples say, Hey, you know the... Jesus, whom you baptized and bear witness, is making more disciples than you. And John said, in verse 27, a man can receive nothing except be given him from heaven. In 28, he say, I'm just here to bear witness. I'm not the Christ. In 29, he said, the one that had the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which stand by, hear him rejoice greatly 
because of the bridegroom's joy. He said, this is my joy, therefore it's fulfilled. And in verse 30, he said, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. You know, we have a gentleman in the church uh, back in Singapore, and it is his habit, and it's a good habit. You know, when he look at people, he always looks for something good to praise them. He doesn't look through the lens, uh, you know, lenses of uh, you know, being critical. And no matter how bad somebody is, or maybe he comes up to sing and he sang badly or something, he always finds something good you know, to praise the person. Yeah. Well, like this guy, um, you know, who can't sing and, um, and he went to sing and, uh, and then uh, somebody in the audience was clapping. And they said, why are you clapping for him? We all can tell he can't sing. So I was not clapping about his singing, I was clapping about his nerve. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that he couldn't sing, but he, he dared go up and sing. All right, I mean, credit to his nerve, his courage. <laughs> Uh, but back here, John the Baptist, when somebody say Christ, uh, make uh, more disciples than you, and John the Baptist say, hey, he must increase, but I must decrease. Um, take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew 18 and verse 4 for a moment. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible reads, and whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18 and verse 4. Now we want to know why John the Baptist, compared to all the prophets and all the men that were born of women, that he is the greatest. Because he is the most humble person. And um, it is for this reason that he is the greatest. Now let's go to uh, Matthew 11 and verse 1 to verse 6. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1 to verse 6. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1, And it came to pass when Je Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed tents to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison of the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now I'd like to pause for a moment to say that um, even the greatest man in the world could never fathom or understand the perfect will of God. See, John the Baptist was in prison at this time. And uh, let's try to understand uh, his mindset. He was called uh, the uh, Herod. He's the voice crying the wilderness to prepare the way for the Messiah. He identified Christ, baptized him, and heard the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, he was expecting Christ would come and set up the millennial kingdom, you know what I mean, and overthrow the, uh, the yoke of the Romans, you know, and Israel will become great and powerful, and there will be peace and order, and Christ will reign as the king of kings and the lord of lords. Um, but after just a brief moment, John was thrown into prison. You know, of course, later we know Christ will die. You see, one thing I've learned over the years is try not to understand how God deals with us. I can never understand. Um, I believe every one of our life is what I call an unfinished story. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, when we think about God's will for our life, we kind of uh, plan it out. At this time, I would <clears throat> be married, have children, have a great job, you know, and uh, things like that. But in the will of God, I mean, there are, there are things that just fall apart, but they are the perfect will of God. And uh, we see here that uh, John the Baptist was in prison, and even the greatest man in the world could not comprehend the perfect will of God. And um, he didn't understand God's plan that, the, uh, that Israel would reject their Messiah and that there would be a second coming. 
and uh, the church age was a mystery to the um, to Israel. They never understood that there was a church age. Um, you know that when they rejected the Messiah, Christ would instead uh, build His church, and where He would say, "Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not uh, prevail against it." They didn't know any of this thing. And so um, even the greatest man, you know, 30 years and a great time in the wilderness, I mean, he has, he has the power of God. He preached and the cities were empty itself. You know, and thousands of people would be uh, repenting and getting saved and getting baptized. And despite all that he had done, he could never comprehend the will of God. Um, When God deals with us, as I said, I, I've stopped trying to understand God's will for me. Um, and uh, I believe that um, everyone's life is an unfinished story. And I believe that every day that God gave us is a day for us to fulfill His will. Now, I hate to sound depressive, but um, you know, every day, that we have, that God gave us, is like a room that we open the door and we go into that room. And then once the door is shut, there's another door in front. And once that door is shut, uh, you, can, you can't bang it, you can't open it, you can't unlock it anymore. You know, because this is today. And when today is over, God gave, opened that door, we walk to the next room. And when we close the door for the next room, that door is permanently closed. I, we can't go back to our past anymore. You know, every day we just move forward. What is known as the arrow of time. The only point one direction forward into the future. And um, so here we see that uh, John the Baptist, uh, the greatest man, couldn't understand the perfect will of God. Um, some have estimated the ministry of John the Baptist. This may shock us. Like uh, how long did John the Baptist have his public ministry? Okay. And the uh, Bible is called a thing that uh, his public ministry ranges from six months to maybe about two years. Because between he and Christ, there's only a six months difference. You know what I mean? And both came to the public ministry at the age of 30. And uh, from the uh, scripture, it looks like after Christ appeared, just a short time later, John was in prison. You know what I mean? I mean... Um, God measure us by not how long we live, you know, but what we have done for Him. And John the Baptist probably had uh, less than two years of public ministry uh, before he was beheaded. Uh, let's go on to uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 24. In Luke 22 and verse 24. <coughs> I'm sorry, in, um, <coughs> all right, in Luke 22 and verse uh, 22 and verse 24. Okay, I'm, I got a, uh, a different passage, I'm sorry. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 3 to verse 12, Matthew 14 and verse 3. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 3 to verse 12. In verse 3, for Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John had said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said to give me. Here John the Baptist hid for on in the charger, and the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath, uh, oath sake. Um, and then we sat uh, with him at meat. He commanded it to be given her, and he sent it and beheaded John uh, in the prison. Well, John the Baptist's ministry ends there. Um, and uh, is John the Baptist a disobedient believer? No. You know what I mean? Is John the Baptist the greatest man in the world? Yes. You know, is John the Baptist a man full of the Holy Spirit? Yes. And yet we see the end of John the Baptist's ministry. 
I mean, he was lonely in prison, and then they beheaded him. But the John the Baptist now is in glory land. <laughs> you know, and he could look back and say, okay, I, I see it now. Everything makes sense. That was the end of my ministry. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> you know, and the Messiah will take over from then, and the apostle. <laughs> you know, I've done my time. I finished my work. You know, I fought a good fight. You know, and Christ will take over, and later on we see the Apostle Paul will come uh, to the scene, and then Paul will take over. And we see we all have a certain part to fulfill. Now, John the Baptist, um, as we see in Matthew, let's go back to Matthew 11 and verse 11. And the Lord said, Verily I say unto you, among them they are born of women, that not reason the greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Well, we're not going to the uh, latter part. There are a number of interpretations. Um, so something the least is referring to the apostle, something the least uh, is um, referring to those that are already in heaven during uh, John the Baptist's day. But uh, most likely, I mean, in my uh, thinking, is that this list here is referring to Christ himself. Uh, because if you take your Bibles and turn to Luke 22 and 24, in Luke 22 and 24, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 24, there was a strife among them which, uh, of, uh, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise uh, authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as a younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that seated at meat or he that serveth, is not he that seated at meat, but I am among you as one that serveth. And so the greatest is the one that serve, and Christ pointing back to himself. You know, that he come as one that serve and not to be served. Um, but as I say, there are a number of these uh, interpretations. Um, in conclusion, let's turn to John chapter 3 and verse uh, 30. John chapter 3 and verse 30. In John chapter 3 and in verse 30, we are close with this verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. I think this verse... And this uh, conviction of John the Baptist sum up why he's the greatest man in the world. You know, I mean, um, we like to think that life is about me. But to John the Baptist, life is not about me or you, but about him, you know, about God. And as far as John the Baptist is concerned, each and every day of his life, he said, uh, I must decrease and God must increase. Whatever they glorify God, you know, I strive to do it. Whether it's repentance, whether it's soul winning, you know, whether it's teaching, preaching, you know, keeping the hymn books, whatever. All right, whatever they will glorify and magnify God, you know, he, he desired to do. So as we uh, sum up, uh, John the Baptist is the greatest man in the world. And the reason he's the greatest, because he's the most humble man. He saw himself as a voice. He saw himself as a nobody. The only thing that he, he wants to accomplish is that God and uh, God's uh, glory must increase. It doesn't matter with him. And uh, that caused John the Baptist to be the greatest man in the world. So to John the Baptist, life is not about me, but life is about him. And uh, his whole purpose on this earth is to magnify God. And so God must increase, and John must decrease in status. And that's what makes John the Baptist such the greatest man in the world. Uh, with that, let's pray. Our Father, I want to give thanks for your word, and give thanks even for this glimpse into the life of the greatest man in the world, and whom our Lord commanded, and um, that uh, John the Baptist, that there is none other greater than he. We look to you, Lord, that uh, he is someone that we can look to emulate and to understand that uh, our purpose on this earth is, to, is about you and uh, there's nothing great about us and that our uh, sole purpose and desire should be one that uh, to glorify and magnify thy great name. 
We thank you for your word. And uh, this may sound to be a blessing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.